Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's CLC lecture series. Uh, I am Tanesh, and I'm from the Center for the Global Cities. Uh, the center was jointly established by the Ministry of National Development and the Ministry of Environment and Water Resources in 2008 to distill, create, and share knowledge on livable and sustainable cities. Um, the CLC lecture series is one of the platforms through which uh, urban thought leaders share best practices, exchange ideas and experiences. And uh, today's lecture is titled, The Future Beckons, Food, Science and Technology. The 2017 Global Food Security Index uh, by The Economist ranked Singapore as the fourth most uh, food secure nation in the world. Having only 10% of our population's food needs produced locally, how did Singapore achieve this level of food security? Looking into the future, what will Singapore's food futures look like? And what is the role of science and technology in enhancing Singapore's food resilience? Let me introduce our first speaker first, Ms. Tan Po Hong, current fellow at the Centre for Local Cities uh, and former Chief Executive Officer from ABA. Um, she's been instrumental in transforming and enabling ABA to face the new challenges ahead in the past decade. And uh, before her time in ABA, she was the Deputy uh, CEO in the Housing and Development Board and now led the estates and corporate group to plan, develop, and manage HDB properties. Without much further ado, can we put our hands together to welcome Ms. Tan to start her presentation first. Is there food? Is there trouble in the food paradise? So if you look at what the uh, FAO is saying, uh, you know, via the UN Sustainable Development Goal, is that, you know, we need to end hunger, we need to achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and also promote sustainable agriculture. And the statistics do actually say that perhaps there are problems, there is uh, trouble, because the number of undernourished people actually increased to 815 uh, from, uh, one, uh, from 777 just two years ago. Right, so Maybe it signals that there might be problems in the production of food. And therefore, food security has actually emerged as a very key concern in various organisational, uh, you know, organisations, whether it's regional or whether it's uh, global. Okay, so that's, that's the stage why here. Huh? Is there trouble in the food paradise? So if there indeed were, then how do we feed the world in 2050? I think we all know this statistics that there will be 9.1 billion people, up from about 7 billion now, in 2050. And in order to feed these people, we need to increase production, food production, by 70%. That's a lot, right? From now, you've got to produce 70% more of food. At the same time, there are a lot of global pressures, both from the supply side as well as demand side. So, for example, climate change. But I think in reality, everybody knows climate change has a lot of impact and even adverse effects. Then, at the same time, we, we talk about population growth. Huh? Just now we said you grow to 9 billion, big uh, numbers. And with um, population growth, we also see rising affluence people more educated, people demanding different kinds of uh, food. So they will put additional pressure on the demand side. On the supply side at the same time, we also have uh, uh, demand for land to be used for biofuels. So instead of growing for food, now land is being diverted for production of biofuels because that's where the money is. So therefore, it means we have less land for production of food. At the same time, because of uh, urbanisation and so on, we also have dwindling resources. As more and more land gets used up, as more and more land gets cleared, there will be less fertile land. If there's less fertile land, how are you? How are we going to grow the food that we all need? So these are pressures, both from demand side and supply side, coming on to us, and it will affect tremendously the uh, uh, food production. Come to Singapore. We call ourselves Singapore as, as a food paradise. So these are statistics that you all know, very familiar with. Um, but in case you don't, we import about 90% of the food that we need. Uh, we are dependent on free trade. If you notice, we don't have, at least in Singapore, we do not 
do any price control on our food. As opposed to many countries, sometimes they use price control as a way to make sure that the food can reach the, the population. And in countries like India, they do do that. And even though we buy a lot from outside, we are a small market. We always think that we buy a lot, therefore we are big. Actually, no. We are very, very small. And I remember when I went to visit uh, Brazil years ago as a CEO of AVA, I thought we are a big player and I go, you know, okay, we are, you know, big buyer. Then they show the statistics, the bar charts, uh, the, the pie chart. And they show China, Middle East, and I said, where is Singapore? Oh, Singapore is under the others. <laughs> because that's why. Well. Although we buy 70% of our frozen chicken from Brazil, but that is very small in comparison. So we're a small market. And because we're a small market, usually it means we aren't as a price taker. Very little bargaining power. Huh? And also we are vulnerable to global food situation. Uh, dependent a lot on the world. Okay, so that's setting the stage for Singapore. Now I move on just a quick uh, definition of what food security is. Maybe, maybe most people may just think, that, well, food security would mean, oh, their food, that's fine. And in Singapore, many of us take food for granted because there's always food. Huh? You go to the supermarket, you go to the mini markets and so on, you see food. And there's a huge variety of food. In fact, if you have friends from overseas and so on, they always tell you, wow, you know, I can find food from you know, Europe, America, South America, and even from Africa. Right? But food security is more than just having food at your doorsteps. Huh? Three key areas, the three A's. First, about availability. Is food really available right, for you all, for us to consume? Then second, even if it's available, that means you could produce it yourself or even could buy it, is it accessible? Right? Is it there when you want it? And so accessibility is also very important. And thirdly, is it affordable? In many countries, especially the developing countries, you find that although it may, the food may be there, but it's not affordable because people cannot afford to buy it. And so affordability is also a very important aspect of food security. And the fourth measure, the fourth factor, is it safe? Is it nutritious? It's no point having all the food there, but it is not safe. Or having a lot of just one type of food and it's not nutritious enough for the consumers, for the population. Looking at all these factors, the uh, Economic Intelligence Unit has ranked Singapore as the fourth. And where are our strengths? They have indicated that our strengths are in food safety, in the uh, availability of safety net programs where food is concerned. That means even uh, people who are very poor, there's a safety net for them to make sure they have food. I think you know all those grants and the uh, community giving out vouchers to go and buy food, you know, from NTUC and so on. And also uh, other areas like nutrition standards, we are also very good. Uh, in terms of food consumption as a share of household expenditure is also our strength. Singapore is doing well. But on the area of challenges, where else can we do better? There's one area which they talk about and that's expenditure on agricultural R&D. Uh, based on that measure, Singapore is not doing very well because they say, oh, you haven't spent enough on agricultural R&D. And that probably makes sense because we don't have a lot of agriculture and therefore as a, uh, when expenditure goes, there's not much focus on it. In an area, we are not doing that well. It's called diet diversification. We do we have a plan to make sure that our people have a diversified di diet? Or are we just eating meats and proteins and so on and so forth? And maybe we are doing okay, but there's no specific national diet diversification plan. Uh, as a result of that, they, you know, we got marked out a little and that's where they feel we can do better. However, Despite being most, for most food secure, there's a concern which they, pointed, which they pointed out, and that's Singapore's dependence on food imports and its susceptibility to rising sea levels, as well as extreme weather events. It makes us even more vulnerable. In fact, if you put in this factor of resources, natural resources and climate change vulnerability, Singapore ranks very, very low right? because we are just too exposed. And so what are we supposed to do? 
I take the answer from uh, SMS, Dr. Kopo Kun, who acknowledges the vulnerability factors like climate change, disease outbreaks, and so on and so forth. And these are things that can, you know, uh, uh, jeopardize our food supply. Right? But he says, fortunately, modern technology is opening up new opportunities for us, for Singapore, for small countries like us. And he gives an example. Advances in indoor agri-technology has made it possible to produce significant amounts of food without delegating huge amounts of land and labour. Is that going to be the answer? Is there more we can do to improve our uh, you know, uh, dependence on imports and improving our, uh, reduce our vulnerability? Just to give you some ideas, this is what we need in terms of our Singapore uh, statistics. What do we eat and what do we mostly eat? So in Singapore, our favourite meat, uh, we're talking about meat, uh, we eat a lot of meat, so our favourite meat is actually chicken. Right, we eat 35 kg of chicken. And I think it's because everybody, uh, regardless of uh, the, the various races, we all eat chicken. Okay, so that's uh, 35 kg. Compared to places like USA or even Malaysia, they eat a little bit more, they eat about 40 kg. Um, we eat a fair, fairly huge amount of pork, 19 kg. Uh, but USA eats more. So USA actually eats a lot of meat, like if you can see, uh, the chicken, the pork, they eat more than we do. Right? Uh, China is even more pork, and that's because I think mostly the Chinese do like pork, huh? so they eat 31 kg. Hmm? Fish, we are about middle. We couldn't get statistics, uh, you know, because I think some of these countries, a lot of them, they just do their own catch, so they don't capture that much statistics. Um, rice. We eat 47 kg. But in terms of comparing to Asia, say Malaysia, 91 kg. And I think if we put in Thailand and uh, uh, Myanmar, Vietnam as well, they eat much more, 100 over. Right? So we are okay. At one stage, in fact, we went down a bit. But in the last, last uh, couple of years, apparently our rice consumption went up. Maybe you all, when you go eat your Thai fan, you always jia fan, jia fan. Huh? So maybe it has gone up. Uh. So our vegetables, okay, we are all right, but we should be eating more because I think again no statistics here. So I do know many countries eat more than 16 kg of leafy vegetables. So maybe that's where our diet diversification uh, you know, should be taking place. In terms of eggs, we need a lot of eggs. In Singapore, we eat like almost every egg a day, except for Sundays. Yeah, if you take 365 and minus your 52, you get your 338. Huh? Yeah, right. so, we eat a lot of eggs, so we're very dependent on eggs because everybody wants your akun, what, your yakun kaya and your half-boiled eggs and so on and so forth, right? And a lot of food we eat actually has eggs inside even though we, we, don't, I mean, we may not be aware. Your buns, your, your cakes, your dessert, and practically everything. Has uh, this thing, uh, oyster, huh? I hear Ben say, say oyster, right? You all jiang, you want more egg, huh? So we do eat a lot of uh, eggs. So this is what we will need in terms for, for our own consumption. So what do we do? So we draw our own food security roadmap. I remember when uh, that time when we started, we said, okay, can we check what other people have for a food security roadmap? We find we can't copy from other people because we are different. We don't produce, right? In other countries, their food security roadmap would be a lot on their production. Right, whether they should be growing this grain or that grain or whether they should be having this livestock or, or the other. We don't have much choice. So therefore, we had to draw our own uh, food security roadmap. So we still fall back on our typical strategy, which is the core strategy to diversify. Uh, because we acknowledge that with only 720 square kilometers, we can't be putting all the land. Even if you put all the land to agriculture, it will not produce enough for us. Right, because say if you want to do livestock, they need lots of land. It will not be enough. Just to give you a, uh, an example, we, we are trying to help. Singapore is trying to help uh, China Jilin food zone. That one is two thousand six hundred square kilometers. Right, just that food zone alone. Right, and that wasn't going to produce everything for us. So even if we do, we may not have enough if we just use normal production methods. Okay, so just to uh, you know, mention, diversification would be our key thing. 
We will need some local production to offset the limits in diversification. And in terms of other supporting strategies on the demand side, we need to do more on food waste uh, reduction. So this is the roadmap that we have and which I think AV and the government is uh, you know, looking at it uh, you know, in a whole of a government kind of uh, approach. Okay, so just some uh, elaboration, proactive food sourcing. Uh, I see some of the food industry people here. I mean, some of you are involved on uh, sourcing for food. Right? And we do it strategically. Then we also work uh, with industry to continue to have uh, new sources. That's where AVA and IE Singapore, they often go to some of the more strategic countries to get new sources. All right? Because if we just depend on one or two, something happens, that, that's the end of the, that food supply. Yeah? Okay, so that's just to show, you know, we buy, Singapore buys from all over the world. These are all the countries, you know, that we do buy from. If you look, it's like every continent, we have food. But we do not just um, do it any old house, suka suka go, huh? We do it strategically, and the key is strategic, to ensure that the source countries are spread out. Different hemispheres, different uh, climatic conditions. So in case some, there's some climate change effect, we are okay, we are not too badly uh, affected. And so it's not as simple as go everywhere, uh, go there very, very uh, strategically. Yeah. However, having said that, that we try to diversify as much as we can, we are still very dependent on the region. Let me just uh, give you some examples. Uh, you see many colours, that's fine. When you see very few colours, that's where we worry. One of them would be our eggs. Right, 75%, three quarter of our eggs come from Malaysia. So every day you have all the trucks and you know, coming across our second link, bringing the eggs to us every day. Uh, and only 25% is produced here by our three farms. Uh, so locally produced egg, only 25% and only three uh, egg farms in uh, Singapore. Leafy vegetables, again, we are dependent on Malaysia. 65 or uh, 60%, two thirds, we buy from Malaysia our leafy vegetables. Leafy means all your Thai sing, your uh, kangkong, your kailang, eh? all those mostly from Malaysia, Cameron Highlands, JB, and so on. Uh, our local production, 12%. Uh, fish, not too bad, you know, we're quite, quite uh, diversified, eh? but still we could do more, and that's why, in terms of uh, local production, we are trying to up. I think, uh, you know, because uh, we don't want just to keep buying from region because fish is also depleting in terms of fish, especially those that are wild caught, you know, catch from the uh, oceans. Eh? Uh, chicken, a little bit dependent, but we are two big sources. Brazil, I was telling you earlier, almost half of all our chicken, but 70% uh, if it's just frozen Luna from Brazil. And then Malaysia, about a third. Again, every day, the chicken will go on the you know the truck and then come across our second link and then go to our slaughterhouses. Hmm? Because the other day somebody told me oh, we don't have fresh chicken. I say no lah. Actually, some of our chicken are slaughtered locally, so it must be as fresh as it can be, right? Although uh, more than half are frozen, uh, mostly from Brazil. Okay, uh, pork. That's also wanted to point out. Again, thirty percent, one third from Brazil. 17% uh, from Indonesia. And these are the live pigs. And these live pigs come across the, uh, on a batch every morning, right? Landing at uh, Jurong there. Every morning they'll take a batch about about 1,000 pigs, right? Come into Singapore for slaughtering. So we still have fresh pork in a way. Although it's a chilled form, but it's still freshly slaughtered in Singapore. Lately, I think uh, we have, uh, Singapore has opened a new source, the Sarawak. Uh, some of them have brought some Sarawak pigs. So instead of taking one day overnight barge trip, they have to take almost three days, taking the boat across the sea to us huh, from Sarawak. So why we uh, don't have eggs on uh, pork on Monday? Because Friday got no pigs coming in. Yeah, they also need to rest, right? So no, I mean it was because I think historically we didn't have uh, pork on Monday, so therefore Friday you don't need the pigs, right? Because when the pigs come in, you cannot slaughter them straight away, you know? Because it will be very tense, right? A lot of that acid. So you must let them rest for one night, overnight. Next day, then you slaughter them. Then the meat is better. 
I don't want to say so much. I see so many meat people here. I think they know more than I do. La. What meat is good and, uh, and so on. Okay, that's so much for it. So local production, I talk about it. Uh, in Singapore, we concentrate on eggs, leafy veg and fish, three areas. Um, over the past uh, four or five years or so, there's been a lot of efforts to uh, raise local production uh, through uh, financial grants to the productivity fund. We also, they have also helped through capability building, uh, technology transfer and so on. At the same time, also through regulations and policies to help uh, you know, uh, in the usage, efficient usage of our land. Also uh, looking at R&D to help the local farmers to up their technology and their skills. AVA has also drawn up a farm transformation uh, map. You know, these days, everything you need transformation map, right? So, you know, in terms of farming, there's also a transformation map uh, in various areas, space, uh, capability building, manpower, not easy to find people, also in uh, innovation, changing mindsets and so on, and also to have an ecosystem. So it's not enough just to go and, you know, do your own uh, land and so on. In the whole ecosystem, the whole infrastructure to support, uh, you know, this uh, agricultural production. I just move on a quick word on food wastage. That determines the demand. If you waste a lot of food, it means you'll demand more, right? Because you're going to throw away 30%, therefore you need 30%. So food wastage reduction is the big thing these days. In Singapore, we're just only starting in the last couple of years. NEA has taken the lead in, the lead in this. Uh, they have done quite a fair bit. But you look at it, 791,000 tons of food waste produced, but only 14% Recycle, which means the potential is tremendous. If we could even reduce by half that wastage, it means we could reduce the demand eh, even more. So some of the people have started doing it, including some of the NGOs, you know, volunteer organizations have come forward. Uh, and uh, for the bread program, Food from the Heart, they distribute 28,000 kg of bread every month. So you save them instead of throwing it away. So what's next? having painted a picture globally uh, and so on. Well, there are much, there's a lot in terms of what we call food futures. And I think both, uh, I mean, ask Linda, even maybe Jack later will talk, uh, look to it later. So just a quick uh, rundown. There's this thing called urban food revolution, changing the way in which food is being produced. And as a result of such a revolution, policies will also have to change. Consumer attitudes will also have to change. The other area, everybody talks about alternate food forms. I'll just go into it a little bit later. So question is, knowing that all these are your food futures, will science and technology be an enabler? We enable the way, pave the way for new food futures. And so there's many studies, many countries, many people are doing it, right? Using systems, sustainability, urban agro. So these are the words that's always you know, being touted when we talk about new food futures. So global trends, how has it been? Many countries have gone on to, even in Singapore, we've gone into vertical farming, use of uh, aeroponics. In the uh, Netherlands, it's uh, robotics, robotic farms. Two persons, they do the whole farm, right? In the uh, in, uh, Netherlands, this farm called Delicious. And um, we have our own Apollo. And uh, these are all our local farms. In uh, Norway, they have automated offshore aquaculture. They're doing it in a big way because they have the sea, they have a lot of space, eh? so they do it that way. Um, in uh, Barcelona, they have a solar powered floating farm. Uh, our own either works, our rooftop vertical aquaponics. And I put question, question, question what will this be in future? We really are not sure. Huh? Because if you remember how the iPhone is being done, right? Who would have thought the phone, the camera, the TV, everything now in one? Well, one day we're farming. Be so integrated that you can have everything in one place? I don't know. So those are possibilities. With science, with technology, maybe some of these things can be done. Because in the old days, you wouldn't have thought that your camera and your TV can be the same thing, right? But now it's doable. It's also a computer. So science, technology, can you help us to you know, improve our trends, to change the way food is being produced? Okay, in uh, Singapore, just some examples, Sky Greens, which you are all familiar with, Apollo for Fish, Sustainer, I will leave uh, Jack to tell you the story, otherwise you've got nothing to say, right? 
just to share a quick example, how Netherlands transformed its uh, agriculture industry. Right, it's small, densely populated. And if you are aware, actually Netherlands, a lot of them, a lot of the land actually below sea level, you know? Then how were they able to uh, improve themselves so that they become the largest, uh, one of the largest exporter of food? The answer is they have actually industrialized the agriculture sector. So it's no longer about farming, killing the soil. They actually industrialized the whole sector. Uh, and so much so, an example is that, you know, they are now the world leader in tomato production and their vegetable production has also increased tremendously. And so Netherlands has done a lot. How did they do it? One of the areas they have done is they have developed high-tech high food clusters. And so in the Netherlands, uh, Rotterdam, it's called Rotterdam Food Cluster. They put the whole ecosystem together, right? So, for example, in terms of production, greenhouses, they're farming near the city, and that's what we always like to call them urban farming. Uh, they are floating farms because they are near the coast, right? Yeah? So, they are floating farms and uh, very modern, robotized uh, greenhouses. And what is also important is education and R&D. There's a lot of them in the region. Right, so for example, you might have the Wageningen University and so on. They all help to support that. Right? Because without the technology, without the R&D, they may not be able to have the technology. And they have the marketplace already there. Every business parks, wholesale markets, and so on. So that's what you have. And these are just examples, very specific examples of those areas that I talk about. This is a Wageningen University. Right? They are, it's known as Wageningen Food Valley. Right, where they do a lot of research in food. Touch a little bit on alternate food forms. I leave to ask them to tell you more about those. But things coming up beyond meat. Are you going to, uh, or lab-based meat, are you going to eat meat that's growing in a lab? Take the cell, stem cell, and grow it. So if you want your uh, chicken breast meat, just take that part and grow it. Right? You culture it, that's what they will call it in the technical term. And hey, presto, you have your chicken breast meat or your uh, lake of ram or whatever, right? You can do it in the lab. Or you have uh, insects as protein. In fact, the FAO is trying to promote this thing called edible insects as a protein source, right? In some of the poorer countries, they can't afford to have the livestock because that's very uh, expensive. So can you have insects? Are we prepared to eat insects because they give you very good protein? Some of you who have gone to China or even Vietnam, Thailand, you might have seen, right? They have a fried, what deep fried crickets and, and even cockroaches and flies. So, good protein. So, are we ready for those? Um, a very old example, actually, we also have one, an over one, an our domestic rice, uh, which is a hybrid, isn't it? Huh? I leave ask Linda to go and talk about it. It's being sold in uh, Singapore, right? But they grow it in Aceh. Indonesia. Huh? Um, then you have what you call CRISPR modified, you know, they, they do the gene. It's not GM, right? It's editing. So I don't know what it really means. Previously it was gene modified. Now they're going to gene editing. Edit it. Uh, then you have a GMO salmon and so on. Then you also have this thing called 3D printed food. Are you all ready to eat them? You 3D, you put the thing together and it'll print out for you. Right? Your steak. These are possibilities. These are things that people are all looking at. So beyond conventional food, this, uh, this thing called impossible foods. Because you know, uh, what do cows eat? Cows eat plants, right? They don't eat anything. If you give them anything else, they get a mad cow disease, right? So they eat plants. So from the plant, they convert, convert, then you get their meat. So why do you need the cow? Why can't you take the plant protein and convert it into something that looks like your meat? even with the dripping blood looking thing. And that's what Impossible Foods is trying to do. Now you can Google Impossible Foods and tell you what they do and so on. They have got this protein you know, called me or whatever. And how they convert it. Because essentially what is happening is you feed your, your thing to the, you know, your grass or whatever pasture, right? To, to the cow, right? Then he converts it. And you get a meat. So why do you need the cow to convert? Why can't you do it yourself? Huh? And you can still get your burger. And that's called Impossible and what's our answer for this? 
Again, I always quote Dr. Kupokun ah, because he's the champion for agriculture and food in Singapore, so I must quote him. Ah. And he says, we are studying the feasibility of co-locating various food-related industries in a sort of cluster. Something like what you know, I showed just now about Rotterdam. Right? Clustering them, putting the whole ecosystem there. Uh, so he says we are studying the feasibility. And if we are doing so, perhaps these are possibilities for Singapore. Uh, can we brand ourselves, have very high quality produce, right? Can we be a world leader and a builder of vertical farms, whether indoor or outdoors? Can we have R&D labs more or, uh, you know, or Thomas can take the lead and do more of this? Can we be the test bed incubator for our entrepreneurs and startups? Then we also need to have more advanced skills for training. You can't just say, oh, I want this. Right, it must be backed up by education, by R&D, by the uh, uh, manpower availability. Uh, can we have more robotics? Can we have auto automation, packing and so on? And can we have more farm factories for all the novel foods that we talk about? Growing the meat or even the insects, right? Or the worms, whatever. Or even the algae and the seaweeds, because these are the new, new foods that's coming up. Right. However, the question remains, and the challenges will always be there. Are we able to shape public perception? And are we able to garner their acceptance so that these foods will have a proper future and these foods can be sustainable? And therefore, the question is, will people accept these new novel forms of food? Uh, so on that note, I leave you with that question. Thank you.